Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are continuing with our series, Dawa Ilallah, on how you can be an effective da'i and how you can call people to the submission to the one true God. That's the purpose of da'wah. Not to anything else, but to Allah. Once they have accepted Allah, then you introduce them to what His Word says. So you'd introduce them to the Quran, and when they read the Quran, then they would learn who the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is, and you would introduce them to that, and so on and so on. Everything is built around the most important concept, and that is who is Allah. Many times when we do da'wah, we bring that in as the last thing. It must be the first point that we raise when we're doing da'wah. So we've been going through this week all the different characteristics of a da'i. In the previous episodes, we've spoken about he has to have knowledge, he has to have good manners, he has to be a person who deals with his character and evolving his character to gain more knowledge. Many other points that are required if you want to know all the points, you'll have to have looked at previous episodes. Today we are moving on to the 11th point, the next point on the characteristics of a da'i. And that a da'i should be just in all his dealings. He should be just in all his dealings. So he must be a person who witnesses to Allah in his teachings. He is witnessing that Allah is just. He's witnessing that Islam is just, and therefore he must be someone who believes in justice. He must be a just person, not somebody who, you know, is wishy-washy, doesn't actually stand for anything. They say if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for everything. So if you don't stand firm on anything, anything that comes along, you will follow that new trend. We find this happening in Islam all the time with our youngsters. Whatever the latest trend is, a new sheikh comes on YouTube, and everybody follows him. And then another sheikh comes on, everybody leaves that sheikh and goes and follows another one, because they don't have a firm foundation. And then many of the things that they're following are not even true. And so you have these people traveling all over the country, they're the fashion of the day. But their teachings are not based on, on anything solid. And the people who are following, the reason they jump around from one sheikh to the other, one teacher to the other, one school of thought to the other, one group to another, is because they haven't got a solid foundation. So it's the job of a da'i to make sure that justice is something that he has developed in his character. That he is a person who is propagating true justice in the world and the system. There's a ayah in the Quran that our brother will inshallah read to us chapter 3 verse 102 for those who are not muslims and might be watching chapter 3 verse 102 we'll read it now all you who believe fear allah as he should be feared last time we were together we looked at how we need to have a fear of allah having a fear of allah a balanced fear of allah will help us to understand why we need to have justice in the way that we deal with things, justice in the dealings that we deal with one another. And so we're now going to read chapter 4, verse 135 of the Quran. Chapter 4, verse 135. And it says, O you who believe, stand out firm for justice as witness to Allah, even though it may be against yourself or your parents or your kin, be he rich or poor. You see, the requirement for justice, even if it is against yourself, against your family, against your tribe, your culture, you still have to stand for it, even if nobody else agrees with it. Because justice is justice. How many people do that in society today? How many people are prepared to do that? And sometimes there is a famous author in America, famous, famous author. I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to give him free advertising. But he's famous, he writes so many books, and he's one of the top writers in America. He grew up in Mississippi, which is like the racist capital of America in those days. That's where he grew up. And to fit in, he had to grow along with the racism of the day, just so that he wouldn't get into trouble. And he couldn't wait to get out of Mississippi as soon as he graduated from high school, because he says in his own words, I was a terrible racist. I was unable to do it. I couldn't. I wasn't good enough as a racist. So he couldn't wait to get out of there so he didn't have to put the act on anymore. And so the interviewer that was interviewing him on his life said, so 
that must have been a brave thing to do because you didn't want to be part of the racist system. And that's why he left. He said, no, I didn't leave it because I was brave. I left because I was a coward. He left the area not because he was brave. He left because he was a coward. Because if he was brave, he would have stayed there and he would have changed the system while he was there. This is from one of the famous authors in America. And that was the most truth I've heard someone speak in a very, very long time, especially on television. Most people were asked with the same situation, like you grew up in a racist community, what was it like? He would have said, yeah, I was hated again, I was, didn't like it, it was unfair. Not him. He said, I went along with racism, I actually tried to be a racist, but I wasn't a very good one. And when I graduated from high school, I tried to get out there as quickly as possible. When they praised him, he said, I didn't leave because I was brave, I left because I was a coward. A brave person would have stayed and changed it. So when we look at the characteristics of justice that are required in Islam, you don't leave America and say, oh, America is terrible and write terrible things about America and sit somewhere else in another country writing things bad. You stay in America. You change it from the inside and you keep to your job no matter what the consequence. If you have a problem with what's happening in India, you don't go and live in Taiwan and complain and write letters against India. You stay in India and you change it in India. If you have a problem with South Africa, same thing. I stayed in South Africa when most of my fellow liberators were sitting in the UK and were sitting in America writing stories about how terrible South Africa was. We stayed behind and we fought. We stayed behind and had to go through the abuse. So in Islam, we have that same teaching that we must stay in for justice. You had a question. Doesn't in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about doing hijrah? Because this world is so vast and you should do hijrah if things are difficult. And did Rasulullah migrate from Mecca to Medina? So how would you explain that? That is not a problem. We're not talking about, we're talking about as a person. Sometimes we need to stand for justice. We're not talking about wars and fighting and battles. We're talking more about how we need to stand for truth. Because sometimes we compromise our truth. You know, there is a possibility in times of war and somebody was to say to you, you're a Muslim, you can say, no, I'm not. There is that teaching you can do, that some people are permitted to do that if they are fearful for their lives. But we are saying as modern day 21st century Muslims that we need to stop apologizing for being Muslims. We need to be proud of being a Muslim. We need to stand up for justice. When we see women being abused in many parts of the world, we see that women are still being raped in this 21st century, how can this still be going on? We need to stand up and make sure that our voice is heard, that we are against this. Start organizations, put implementations into place that prevent these type of things from happening. It is for us to stand up for truth and justice. What does Superman say? I stand for truth and justice. But we need to be real life characters standing for truth and justice and not being afraid. However, if you're in a situation and you're under threat and your family is under threat, you are welcome to go and leave. But then you don't sit there and then say well, how brave and how powerful you are when you're hiding somewhere else. The way to change a political system is there in that country where you are. People take you seriously, unless you're under house arrest or whatever, then you've got no freedom to say anything. If you look at how many of the modern day liberated countries, how they were liberated, they were liberated from inside. They were not liberated by foreign countries and foreign powers. Maybe they're very, very new systems. But if we look back in the 80s and 70s, 60s and periods like that in time, the people who stayed, it was a long time to change the system. So we have to stand firm for justice. We have to stand firm in what we are calling to as a witness towards Allah. So you're just standing as a firm justice because it suits us for whatever campaign we want to do. Those people who are on Facebook will see a million campaigns a day. But they're not standing for Allah. They're not standing firm on Allah. They're just silly campaigns. Baking campaigns, chocolate sweets campaigns, all these other things. Those are not serious campaigns. We're talking about serious, we're talking about justice. It stands in the truth of the Sharia and Allah. That's what we are asking people to look at. So this is the type of characteristics that a Dai needs to have and instill in the people around him. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir. The Islamic bomb. Islam comes 
from the Arabic root word salam or salam which means peace. It is also derived from the root word silm which means to submit your will to Almighty God. People who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran that he created the death and the life, the life for the purpose, for the purpose of, testing of testing us. Taqwa and truthfulness, humility and repentance, kindness and gratefulness. Are you prepared for the final exam? Are you ready? Generosity and tenderness give true value to life. To answer the most important exam that you will ever that face. Will ever face. Dr. Jonathan Cazales. Live your live life, your life purpose. on purpose. Learn to utilize every moment of life to make it meaningful and precious in Live Your Life on Purpose. Every Sunday at 5.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 11.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Discussion, 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 debate, 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 rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal. Conclusion. conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire every Saturday at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12.30 p.m. UK on Peace TV. Courage it takes to stand up for what you believe in. Courage it takes to be true and righteous. Courage it takes to dare and answer. Your questions, be they social, political, economic, educational or religious. To get clear and convincing answers. Test your courage and question me in there to ask. Dare to Ask, next on Peace TV. Another important aspect of a day is that he should be, and it, this depends culturally as well, because if you say we're talking about the German situation, a soft-spoken day, no one's going to listen to him. So they want a more aggressive phrase. But what we're talking about here is that a day's characteristic According to this book called Dawa Ilallah, in his book he writes that Adai should be soft spoken. What he means is not soft spoken like this, where no one can hear what you're saying. He means to be soft spoken in his character. We're not looking at the literalistic interpretation of that. We're talking about how he needs to be a person who speaks with respect. He's not standing there like two weeks ago we spoke about how the New Testament was put together and how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the four books that make up the New Testament. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have Jesus, peace be upon him, as narrated by the Christians in their text, a very soft-spoken man. When he speaks to his people, he's soft-spoken. He's very gentle. He's very firm, but he's very gentle. He's very soft-spoken. But in John, he's like Thor. He's angry and aggressive and forceful and overbearing. You see, the one book writes them totally different to the other three books of the New Testament. So when we talk about soft spoken, we're not going to either of these extremes again. You have a question? Asalaamu As Alaikum. Wa alaikum wa when we are inviting the Christians and uh, they are so afraid of the hellfire as they have been taught so by the church, how do we remove that fear from their hearts so that it's easier for them to come to Islam? We won't be dealing with that at this point as yet because we are dealing with the characteristics of a dai right now. When we get to the point where we start to talk about how you talk to people on different issues, we will go through church doctrine. So we look at baptism. We look at talking in the Holy Spirit, you know, when they speak in tongues. 
We'll look at all the different issues that Christians have as their doctrines, because Christianity is based upon church doctrine, not on the Bible. Most people think, and it's believed even by Muslims, that Christians gain their information from the Bible. It's not true. Christians gain their knowledge from church doctrine, and church doctrine is projected onto the Bible, and then they will open it and go, well, we need to find a verse to back what we're saying up. And so they hunt through all the pages and look, oh, there we go, here's a verse that backs up the Trinity. Well, they think it does. And so the vast majority of the people say, we're going to build this doctrine around the Trinity on this verse. And then Jehovah Witnesses come along and they go, let's find a verse to disprove what they are saying. And guess what happens? They use exactly the same verse. The same verse as people are proving the Trinity, the Jehovah Witnesses use to disprove the Trinity. This is a classic case of the fact that they did not read the text and allow the text to tell them what they should believe. They went with their own preconceived ideas, thinking, what can I say? What can I do? How can I manipulate this to back what I already thought up? If we look at the Jehovah Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, and the Mormons, these are like the three splinter churches in the world that are outside of the mainstream. You have Catholics, Protestants, and the Jehovah Witnesses. The three of them decided they needed to have a doctrine, but they were very similar to each other. Almost, in fact, all their doctrines are just plagiarized from each other. They just changed the names of the organizations. So they all tried to decide who Jesus, peace be upon him, is. He couldn't be God. That they knew because they'd already disproved the Trinity. So one said, no, he's Michael, Michael. The other one said, no, he's Gabriel. The other one said, no, he's Raphael. So each one had a different interpretation of who he is. But they didn't have a doctrine to, there's nothing in the Bible that says that. It's just doctrine. So we'll look at all that, inshallah, when we get to that point later. But what we're talking about right now, though, so we're going to look at all those things later and we'll be able to make sure Dawah more effective than just simply saying John 3.16, John 1.1, 1, 1, Romans 3.23. It's not going to help. We need to understand their doctrine. We have to go to the source and remove the source. When the source is removed, there's nothing to stand on. We attack the Bible, they just laugh at us. We have to attack their doctrine. That's where we will be if we'll see victory in Shul. So we see that a Dai must be somebody who is soft spoken in his character. So he's not going to go there. You know, sometimes you have a Christian on campus, or maybe there's a Christian that comes to the MSA meeting or whatever, comes to the, a public talk. Maybe there's a debate. And the Christian stands up and he asks a question or he makes a, a claim. And so the brother becomes very aggressive in the way he answers him, very angry, antagonistic. And then all the Muslims, like a pack of dogs, all start attacking this guy, maybe standing there. On the, this is not the character of a Muslim. We mustn't embarrass the person. We mustn't become worse, the worst things. You know, we must be people who have good character, good way that we speak. If you go to Christians, they're very smart at this and actually teach this on how to do this. If they come and say, I did a, a lecture to a predominantly Christian audience, and then it comes to question and answer time, they will start their question by saying the following. Thank you very much for your lecture. I can see that you've gone into a lot of research in the way that you've studied a lot about the Bible, and you've gone into a lot of research and have analyzing everything that you are saying to us today. But I have a question. See what he's done? He's bloating your ego, he's softening you, and then he goes in for the attack. This is how they trained to do it. They taught how to do it that way. We just go straight for the jugular. And then sometimes that can actually, you know, they expect that and they go, see, typical. We have to be cautious. We must use wisdom in how we speak to people. So when someone asks a question, and we might not agree with it, say, what do you mean by that? Always ask every question that is asked to you, reply with what do you mean by that? If he says, how do you come up with the idea that Allah is God? Christian might ask you. Ask him, what do you mean by that? He doesn't even know what he means by that. It's something that he's rehearsed. It's something somebody told him. It's something that he read on a book somewhere. He doesn't know for himself why he's even asking the question. So when you say to him, what do you mean by that? He's caught off God because now he has to go, what do I mean by that? What do I mean, who is God? What do you mean by who is God? Ask him a question so you get specific answers to the question that he's, he's going to be asked. Because there's too many broad paints, too many broad questions. They say a broad brush stroke is the expression. You know, paint like madly. 
If you see someone who's a good artist, he takes a small little brush, you've got five, six hairs on it, and he gets his details. That is what we want to get from a question. What detail? Well, give me a broad question. So most times, ask him, what do you mean by that? So this is what we are talking about when we are speaking about the characteristics of a dai, that we need to be someone who doesn't attack. We are soft-spoken. We listen to what they're actually saying. When somebody answers you, repeat what he said to you. Why is that important? Because sometimes what you hear is not what he's saying. You are thinking from your own perspective what you think he said. It's not what he said. So when somebody says, well, you know, I don't believe that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is the messenger of God. You say, am I hearing you saying that you don't believe God sent prophets? And he said, no, 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 I believe God sent prophets. I'm just saying that I don't believe in the final prophet. And you say, so you want to repeat what he's saying back to you, so you're getting the right understanding of what he's saying. Because sometimes we, he's not saying that at all. And you're just coming from your own perspective. So always, even though it'll be aggravating and people will not like it, even with your wife, it's something worth doing. It'll bring peace and harmony in the home. If your wife says something, repeat what she said back to her. Ask her if she asked you a question and you answered it, ask her to verify this is actually what she's saying. Because sometimes we don't always understand what women are saying. And so we get ourselves into trouble because we interpreted it. Instead of saying, is this what you are saying? It's a very a small little thing, but it helps in dawah. To always, when the person answers, say, is this what you're saying? And then clarify things that way. So this is all under being the character of how a dai should be, that he's soft-spoken. This all is incorporated under that point. Now, a dai should be a person, the next point that this author brings up, he says that a dai should be moderate in his behavior and attitude. Moderate. So what is moderate? Moderate is not going from one extreme to the other. You know, sometimes we have in this, the, this world want people who have gone to extremes in Islam and they need to have the middle. It doesn't mean we compromise. Moderate does not mean compromise. So write that in big letters in your books, write it in big letters in your brain. Remember at home, moderate does not mean compromise. Some people believe you must compromise Islam to fit in with the society that you're living in. You must compromise Islam to fit in with your Christian community, Hindu community, Buddhist community, atheist community. That is not what we are saying. We're talking about moderation, being moderate. And by, we must also be careful what we understand by the word moderation. Because even moderation is different. I often hear Christians saying to each other, you know, you can drink, but drink in moderation. Well, if you're an alcoholic, your moderation level is very, very different to somebody who has a casual drink on Christmas Day only. Uh, like some Christians do. So this one is having a glass of wine, and this one is drinking a barrel of beer a day. So his moderation level is going to be very different to his moderation level. His moderation beer is going to be one sip, and his is going to be a half a liter a day. So moderation has to be understood as well as based on the Sunnah, based on the Quran. This is what we are talking about. Not your interpretation of moderation. So we're not compromising, and we're not taking moderation to the extreme. We're keeping a balance in what we do. And so when we look at the way we behave and our attitude as a dai, it must be of a moderate nature, not prone to extremes on either way. So we don't compromise, but we keep a balance. We don't want to go say, you know, some people go to the other stream and everything is haram. In the other group, everything is halal. So we want to keep a balance there. You know, there are things that are permissible and there are things that are not. Don't lie about things that are not permissible to suit the audience. They say, oh no, it's, it's okay, you can do... No, you can say to the person, it's not permissible, but we understand you're new to Islam. Don't worry, take your time. Allah will forgive you because he knows that you're still in ignorance. And you, but you don't say ignorance, but he'll help you along as you go. So we want to be moderate. Well, that's all the time we have again. So you'll have to join us again, same place, same time next week. We'll continue with our series building the structure of Dawah Ilallah. So from us in the audience, from me, Arib Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.